What is up, everyone? This is episode number two of the Idea to Reality podcast with real estate entrepreneur Spencer Chambers, and I am your host, Tal Tamir. If this is your first time listening in, I want to say first and foremost, welcome. My intentions with the Idea to Reality podcast are to help people who have a great idea execute on it and bring it into reality to create a thriving business or lifestyle. This will be accomplished through interviews with entrepreneurs, business owners, and thought leaders who have taken a great idea and turned it into reality. We will focus on the micro steps they took to get to where they are today and provide you with actionable steps on how to execute on your dreams. On the show today, we have Spencer Chambers. Spencer is the author of Dating Your Investments and the CEO of the Chambers Organization. Providing his strategic expertise in investments, sales, and building, Spencer has positioned himself as a leader in the real estate industry. Without further ado, sit back, relax, make sure you take notes, and enjoy this incredible interview with Spencer. Okay. Hey, Spencer. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to me and my audience, and I really am excited to hear all about you and your story and your successes so far in your young life. So let's just uh, jump right into it. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. I feel honored to be one of your first people on here. Uh, no, the honor is mine. Seriously, I'm very excited to, uh, to hear all about what's going on right now in your life. So before we get started with the present day, I want to take it to the beginning, take it to your humble beginnings. What was your childhood like? You know, what was your life like growing up? Tell me a little bit about that. So my childhood was great. Uh, my parents were developers, builders. My dad was a builder and my mom was an interior and architectural designer. Had a great life. They owned a couple businesses, a couple rental properties. You know, to the outside, it was great. To the inside, I hated construction. That's the one thing people really don't know with my career now, being kind of the, the guy in construction and making a construction company mimic uh, kind of what Uber did to taxi companies. I mean, I really didn't like construction. And I realized through the process of getting older, and we'll talk about it, uh, but it wasn't construction. I didn't like it. It wasn't the way that my parents ran their company. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were very mom and pop, and I am obviously corporation. So it was just a different mentality, different. I think it's a generational thing as well. Uh, it, It definitely changed a lot of things for me and my life and I think growing up has helped me and more so helped me what not to do than what to do but I'm sure we can get into that later right yeah so you saw I mean I see this a lot in my life too how not to do things and then you take that and it makes you realize how you want to do it and how it's kind of best to be done right is that kind of what happened yeah, and I mean, I, I don't want to make it like they were bad or anything. We no, live in a no, nine. Course. We lived in a nine thousand square foot house with Range Rovers, Mercedes, Escalades, boats, all kinds of stuff. Like I didn't grow up with a silver spoon, but I definitely grew up, you know, in, in an upper middle class. Number one, and number two, to for the record, my parents absolutely did not give me anything to get started on this adventure, this business. They didn't give me any money. You know, Donald Trump got a million dollars from his dad. What they don't know is he also got $3 million in chips, and his dad gave the casino, Taj Mahal, $3 million, walked out with the chips. That's like a $3 million loan. Like all these different (laughs) things. I didn't do that. I literally did it all on my own, like legitimately. Yeah, that's awesome. So how – you say you did it all on your own. Um, I was reading up on you, doing some research, and I saw that when you were 17, you kind of started to get incorporated in the business. Will you tell me about that a little bit? Yeah. So like I said, I hated construction, but I realized if I could work smarter, not harder, which is you know, a big concept I like to work with, is I could sell the houses. Problem I didn't know because I was young and inexperienced, which is probably a good thing. Houses weren't selling in 2007. My parents had built a bunch of houses, townhomes, condos, all that stuff, but they weren't moving. And so me having this, uh, I guess, naive thought process of why aren't they selling? Let's just put a car with them. Somebody will buy a house and a new car and they'll be happy, right? And so it was 2000, I think, seven when it all kind of started to hit the fan. And so I went around to the different dealerships 
and quite frankly, it was so I could drive the cars around while they were selling, but <laughs> that's beside the point. Uh, I had them put the cars in the driveway of these houses. And because I did that, they sold. I got news coverage because it's never been done before. And so that kind of started this process of I could literally sell a house and make a good amount of money versus having to build the whole house and maybe make money, maybe not make money. Right. No matter what, I'm still going to make my commission. So I'd rather work smarter and not have the risk and the liabilities and all this stuff and just come in at the end and sell the thing then have all the liability, have to actually do the physical work, and then still hope that it sells, and then have no control if they can sell it right or not sell it right. So it was just a different way of thinking, really. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's such a huge risk with the, that the builders take. My grandfather actually was in the uh, building business and development of land and all that, but that was, you know, many years ago. Things are much different now, so... Like the, it was good. I think how that happened in 2007. Obviously, your parents didn't think it was good, but how you kind no, of I mean, saw we, that we first made out. Hand. We didn't go bankrupt or anything, so that's good. They they were smart. They just were were big, and, and they were in this middle stage where they weren't small, as they could have been. Where a mom and pop, where they just liquidated the one project and been fine, but they weren't a big enough company to be able to absorb it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then rent them out or pivot to be able to make money off the situation. So the market turns down and they're SOL versus the market turns down and it creates an opportunity. That's the difference. Right. No, for sure. So tell me about that whole thing with the car. So you would make a deal with these dealerships and they would um, sell a car with the house. Is that how that was working? Yeah, so I went to all these dealerships that I had made connections with, and I said, hey, I want to do an exclusive rights deal with you. I will take your car, and I will cross-market, because we have the same clientele, right? Mm -hmm. I probably didn't put it as eloquently, because I was 17. <laughs> right. But the reality of what I was doing was I was cross-marketing to their demographic, which was also my demographic selling these houses, which was newer, nicer, higher-end condos, for lack of a better word. So from there, it just kind of made sense. They're like, yeah, we'll give you a car to put in the driveway. It's going to sit in their showroom. Nobody was buying cars or houses at that point, mm -hmm. right? So it's either going to sit in their showroom, in the back lot, or at this house and potentially be sold at this house, get more exposure. They get a sign. We got the signs. People were like, what the heck's going on? It just created this buzz. So much buzz that it literally... I think it was like Channel 4 News came out and did a story on it. Like it had never been done. And so these dealerships are like, what the heck? This is crazy. I'm, why, how, how did you think of this? I'm like, I don't know. I just wanted to drive the car here, right? Or whatever I said. But it was, dude, I was 17. Right. I didn't have this preconceived notion of, oh, you can't do that. You, you shouldn't do that. It's never going to sell. I just did it. And I think that's a lot of problems with a lot of people is they think about it too much. There's no action. There's a lot of thinking, which I'm not saying don't think and take calculated risk and all that stuff. It's very important to be analytical, but you also can't have analysis paralysis. You got to take massive amount of action. And in my book, I talk about this. You have the point of inception, but after the point of inception, which is where you initially have the thought, you got to take massive action. And the example in this is you're sitting in this bar and you see this drop dead total blonde bombshell definitely like it's 11 on a 10 scale <laughs> walk by and you're like damn she's hot that's great that doesn't do anything that doesn't get you a number that doesn't get you an opportunity to talk to her you know what the next step is you gotta take massive action it means you gotta go fight all those other dudes that are thinking the same thing you gotta overcome the fear of rejection and go make the move that is what is the most simple way to describe how you got to think about it in business. Oh, I love that uh, the analysis that you use there. Is that something that you use in your book? I do. Dating your yeah, investments. If you can date, you can invest. I think that in its own is super unique. And just when I came across that, I was like, I really love because you know, you, there's so many real estate books out there and how to invest, how to do this. 
but yeah, nothing boring. like it's boring. Exactly. You know, there's so many how to invest books. Yeah. This, that, there's, I don't, you tell me one book that talks about Kim Kardashian's butt. You talk about a boob job. Talk about Tinder in a real estate book. <laughs> you show me one more book that says that. There's not one. It'll definitely keep you on the edge of your seat. I'm sure I'm excited to uh, read that here soon. So wait, not to jump ahead of time, but where no, did fine. where did that kind of come into play? When did you decide you want to write a book? So I was in real estate. I've been in real estate. I got out of real estate, which I'm sure we'll get to, uh, went into fashion for a bit. But then I got back into real estate because there was so much money mm-hmm. to be made, right? It's the only real thing that really, really can get wealth, right? You can have money. You can get rich. But real wealth is not like just something that comes and goes. It's there for a while. So anyway, I was um, building in Seattle, had a house in Newport Beach, brokerage in Newport Beach, flying back and forth every week. And I was just like, man, like I got to I kind of miss the game. Like I'm working too much. I was married. I just miss the, the opportunity to interact with people like when I was dating. And then I started thinking about this on a plane of, well, why couldn't I just do that with business? It's kind of the same thing, right? I mean, you're talking to people. You're trying to get them interested. You're trying to not sell something, but sell yourself, right? It's the same same concept, really, right. if you think about it. And then what? But, but after you're done dating, what happens? You get married. You have kids. You have grandkids. That's the same thing with an investment. You get married. You do the investment. You have kids. You do more investments. You finally do enough investments where you don't have to manage the investments because you have a a portfolio manager, and you can pop in and pop out just like a grandparent does. And I thought about this concept. I was like, man, it really is like the start of dating. (laughs) And so I I wrote the book, Dating Your Investments, because if you can date, you really can invest if you make your dating life an experience, which is very complicated, but you understand it. If you can assimilate that to investing, with it's just complicated, but nobody understands. But now because you understand dating, you understand investing. It totally makes sense. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I think uh, real estate investing can kind of uh, get scary for people. You know, it's like this big thing. Yeah, it's a fear of the unknown. Right, exactly. And when you break it down like you do in your book, I think that, simplifies the whole process for people like oh you know it is just like dating if i can go do that why can't i go invest in some real estate so i think it's really going to be a a big boost for people to kind of understand that it's not like such a dark deep void it's something that we kind of go through our whole lives you know yeah i mean if you can go to a bar you can go to open house if you can date (laughs) somebody you can look at investments and do the numbers right what's what is dating let's let's break it down quickly Dating is not a romantic relationship. Dating is the process of exploring if that person is the right fit for you, right? Right. It's not necessarily just referring to a romantic relationship. It can be more than that. And that's where the the culture in America and Europe and a couple other countries have it just kind of wrong. When they talk about dating, it's always boyfriend, girlfriend, or whatever. Not anymore. It's the process of exploration, Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, that makes total sense. So let's um, jump back into your story here a little bit. So you were 17 when you did the whole thing with the cars and selling the houses, right? Yep. How long were you doing that for? You know, I did it just until we sold the inventory. And then um, I was like, yeah, that's fun, but it's not me. So I was actually going to culinary school. Then I realized, hey, I actually want to make real money. I don't want to just be the back of the house chef. So I would rather be a celebrity chef and own a restaurant one day. But in order to own a restaurant, you got that money. So definitely not going to go that route. So I literally bailed on a full ride scholarship to one of the best culinary schools in America um, and went into kind of real estate management. So I would take people's vacation homes and manage them while they were out of town. Some of them were snowbirds, things like that. And we had Coachella, 
you know, Paris Hilton would stay in some of the houses, that kind of clientele base. Um, the, what, there was Coachella in Palm Springs. And so there, that was a huge market for us. So I did that. And then my dad was building at that time the Betty Ford Rehab Clinic. He took two buildings and merged them together doing construction and uh, fell off the roof. And that kind of was a big blow because he, he became fully disabled. Uh, he's still alive, but but it was a very hard time for our family. Oh, right? man. That's, I'm so sorry to hear that, man. That's crazy. Yeah. No, this is the stuff you can't find in the book. Yeah. So this is this is the real life stuff. This is where I kind of got thrusted into the head of the house like instantly within like I'm talking a couple hours. I was now the head of the house in charge of a 9,000 square foot house, two companies that are in two states and four brothers, a dog, and then at that point really my mom cuz she was not a basket case, she held herself together, but I mean, it was pretty traumatic. Oh, no, so, of course. So being the oldest, it just kind of thrusted me into being an adult quickly, like really quick. And this is in 2009. So how old were you so, when this happened? You were 19? Uh, probably. I don't know exact dates, but I know it was 2009, April, when that happened. So so from there, I was like, you know what? I don't know if I really want to do this anymore. And I kind of ran from it, if that makes sense. Like I, I just really didn't know what else to do. But I was like, you know what? I don't know if I really want to be in construction. I've had all these bad experiences. It wasn't really a good fit. Then my dad falls off. And it's like, man, I'm going to go into fashion. It's the farthest thing away from real estate. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's what – so I went into fashion, traveled the whole world. Not the whole world, but a lot of the, the world and, and do fashion in Peru. Owned a company in Brazil who manufactured in Guangzhou, China. Like just global stuff. And I was probably 21, 22 at the time doing these massive, you know, importing from different countries at my age. I was like, I didn't know what the hell I was doing really. Like I did it, but I didn't really know. I just learned on the fly. And I was working with some really big names at that point for like the CEO of, uh, of rock and Republic denim at the time was really big. He was one of the people helping me like just some big names. We were partying with ASAP Ferg in Vegas cause he was, there it's just crazy stuff and then i realized man if i was spending as much money on fashion as i or excuse me on real estate as i did in fashion i'd have been a millionaire for sure because it takes about one to three million dollars to start a fashion company and that's your burn rate so before you even make a profit you're going to spend that much money wow so it's really cash hungry company and it's just changing you got to live two months or excuse me two years ahead of all the trends and you're manufacturing and then you got to excuse me sell and you got to have all these things going on it's just a lot and if you did that much and that much complication in real estate and building whew, you spend the breeze, million right? <laughs> yeah you you bet you spend a million bucks in real estate you're gonna end up with three million exactly. there is no burn rate mm -hmm. it's an investment so I decided to go back into it, and that's how I got into what I'm doing now. Awesome. So how did you get into the uh, jewelry line? I know you said that whole traumatic experience happened with your dad, and it's kind of the farthest thing, like you said, almost like running away from it, which I can't yeah. blame you at all. You know, That's some, some serious shit that, that happened. But how did you yeah. kind of get involved with that? What uh, connections did you have? You know, Who did you have to reach out none. to? I had none. I had nothing. My family had never been in fashion, didn't know anything about it. And I was like, I'm going and forging a path. I'm going to do it myself. And somebody had said, hey, you're so fancy. You probably got diamonds in your underwear. <laughs> and I said, no, but that's a really good idea. Oh, wow. And so I'm the only one that I know of in the world that has ever put diamonds in men's underwear. And they, did, they had to create special things, and so it doesn't touch the skin, a special setting so that they could be washed and all these different things. And it, it really, really took about two years to create. And it was it was a really cool product, really cool product. And uh, it took me, like I said, all over the world. But at the end of the day, it's still a product-based mm. business, and it's inventory-heavy, and it's just not uh, – it's fun. It is really fun. And it's good to create a paycheck, and you can get rich. 
you know, I know a couple people. But there's guys like the CEO, uh, CEO, excuse me, of Rock and Public Denim, Michael. He would take out, I think, ten million dollars a month out of the company. But guess what? He still went bankrupt. Yeah. Like it's just you can still lose it all so quickly. It's not, it's not indestructible. Real estate really is indestructible, in my opinion. Like I don't care if cryptocurrency works. I don't care if stocks and bonds work. At the end of the day, the internet crashes. And you're trading camels because there's a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> somebody's gonna need a place to live. Right. So I mean, that's where I look at it, and I say, look, it's the most secure investment I can come up with. Yeah, you could make arguments, you but let's use common sense and just practical, practical thinking. What do you need to survive? You need a house. You need food. And that's really about it. You need fire. Yep. That's fire you can make. Right. Food, water, and a roof over your head. You know, that's about sums it up, the necessities. Uh, yeah. So I think if you can have a, a house and you can rent it out or you can whatever, you still are going to win in the end, no matter what. Right. No, that's awesome. I love how you did that with the with the the jewelry not the jewelry the uh jewels. fashion brand the jewels yeah. the jewels for your junk <laughs> yeah very, very creative name and so was that like your first idea that you kind of had there like i'm just gonna do this and figure it out on the way um yeah for for business on a big scale yes i've always been that way i mean i grew up Literally, I can remember at like 10 years old thinking of business plans and writing business plans out because I couldn't sleep. Like legitimately, it's weird. I feel like a nerd. But the truth is, that's what I did. I mean, I just am all business and I enjoy it. I really do. Wow. So. That's awesome. So to not dwell on this too much. No, that's fine. Because um, I know we want to jump into the real stakes. Like you said, that's what you're all what you're doing right now. But you were saying that with this brand you had no connections you didn't really know the industry very well how did you kind of um get that whole thing started and how did that take you to becoming the ceo of nexi which is also another fashion company yeah that's a whole nother story <laughs> so this is like people say you got to put your balls to the wall and put your money where your mouth is this is truly that story like i had no connections whatsoever I went down to the L.A. Fashion District. I had always heard about it. I never had been there. And I walked the street, literally walked the street and just asked people where I could go to find not what I needed, but what I thought I could use because I didn't even know what I needed. Quite frankly, I didn't know how to sew. I didn't know how to. But I just walked the street, immersed myself in it. I literally met people that were just on the street in a store that wasn't even like a wholesaler. It, it wasn't even a real fashion. It was just a, like a, a, a retail kind of in the fashion district that could help you, but they didn't really know what they're doing because they're more just a retail store. Right. Mm -hmm. So I used that to get to where I really could figure out what it was that I was going to make, how I was going to make it led me down different tracks i don't suggest it because it took me a lot longer than it should have but i did it right and you got to be so motivated that you don't need somebody to help you you'll figure it out on yourself and my number one i think my number one strength is i'm extremely resourceful throughout the years and people have noticed that and, and told me and i didn't even know that that wasn't normal honestly growing up i just figured hey i was the it really brings back that we didn't get to talk about really, but the number one story that kind of explains everything is we were walking through Costco and I was in, I think sixth grade and I wanted this blue Jan sport backpack, the double zipper Jan sport. It was super cool at the time. Everybody had one, but I had like three backpacks, right? And they weren't bad backs. They just weren't the blue Jan sport. And this Costco was like 20 bucks. Now they're probably like 60 or a hundred now with inflation. Who knows? Anyway, so my mom said, no, you have a backpack. You don't need it. But I had six bucks in my pocket. I actually had a wallet back then because I was a cool kid that was a nerd. Uh, 
and so I said, you know what? There's bubble gum right here, and this pack of bubble gum is five fifty, and it has what a thousand pieces. <laughs> right. And if I could sell each one of those for five cents, I would make enough fifty bucks or whatever the number was to buy the backpack and pay myself back because I wanted the backpack. Mm-hmm. So, and I did it. And so then I had to figure out how to sell it. How do I sell the bubble gum? I held a bubble gum blowing contest, supply and demand in its finest in sixth grade. So I ended up getting a call to the principal's office. But it, you know you're doing good when the principal <laughs> comes to you. Right. I didn't go to the office. He came to my locker, which was my storefront. You know? <laughs> so that's how, that's how you know you're doing good. Anyway, so back to that. That's how I, I, I kind of am. I'm just that way. Yeah, just very right? resourceful, yeah. I'm extremely resourceful. And you have to be. When you're growing a business, you have to wear every hat and know how to do every single thing within your company. Because how can you expect somebody to do something you won't do yourself or haven't done to do yourself so you don't know how to check in, yeah, right? Absolutely. So here, if you guys are taking notes, this is a good one. If you delegate, you must inspect. And that's just a practical piece of advice one of my mentors gave me. So you're, if you don't inspect it, you're just dumping it, right? Mm. So if you're going to delegate something or say you're delegating, you better inspect it because it means something to you to follow up and make sure they did it right. Otherwise, it's just dumping it on them to get it done. Yeah, I, lo- I like that a lot, actually, that you said that. It makes total sense. And even take it a step further, you know, to delegate and actually – when you're checking up on it, actually care about it and care about the person that's doing it and try and help them however you can. Not saying, oh, this isn't right. Like, you suck. But, like, give them some tips. Like, this is how I would do it because you have the experience of exactly. actually going through it. You know, you know what they're going through, basically. Yeah, and I think you'll get that through. You know, you have this idea, and that's really what your podcast is about. You have an idea. And so your audience wants to make it the reality. But do they have the guts? Do they have the resourcefulness to make it a reality? But then even to take it from reality to now I got to scale it to make money, right? Mm-hmm. To make it a real business. You got to then transform and put people in place to scale because you can't do it alone. It, it really has been my biggest mistake, I would say, is I, I'm very resourceful. And I kind of have a problem where – it's not that I'm a control freak. People just say I'm a control freak. It's not necessarily that. It's more my way's better, right? Right. I know it. I'm faster. I'm stronger. I understand it. I'm quicker. It just works, right? So for me to have somebody else do it, it's almost more of a pain because I got to inspect it, whatever. All by the time I spend a lot of time, I might as well have just done it myself. So in the beginning, it's okay to do it yourself and not be big. But when you're trying to expand from, you know, 10 grand a month to a hundred million a month or whatever, a million a month, whatever your, your metrics are that you're trying to get to your goals, you're going to need people to do that. You really do. So you got to be focused on building a team. And one practical piece of advice for the, for the idea to reality is look at people that will invest in your idea and maybe you're not ready for them, but look for talent before you need the person to fill the position. Look at for somebody who you think, hey, that'd be a great team member. They're honest. I can trust them. Versus just, hey, uh, it's time for me to hire somebody. I'm going to hire the first person that fits the mold. Right. And like then the, what? You would start building a relationship with that person yeah. and just kind of get to know each other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and maybe start them out part-time, whatever. You're, you're a small business, right? This is a practical piece of literally baby steps. How are we going to do this, take this business from an idea to a reality? you got to kind of think outside of the box a little bit, right? Oh, yeah. You can't just – if your business is going to solve a problem, which, by the way, guys, listening, if it doesn't solve a problem, you need to think about that because – Every good business has always solved a problem. So that's your number one question you got to ask yourself. I know what my business has solved the problem. And I know what businesses failed and didn't solve a problem, which I learned more from that, I think, than anything. Right? 
Mm-hmm. So when you're going from reality, you got to know how to take these baby steps and how to get these these this business really to grow. It's like a baby. You got to you got to be able to nurture it. But you have to know how to be a parent to be able to nurture, right? Yep. I know we got way off track, so sorry about that. No, but no, I feel like you guys got to listen to this part. Yeah, um, no, that's that's what this is all about, you know, getting those practical like you said, all, just like baby steps and knowing exactly how to do it, hearing it from someone like you who's done it on multiple levels and who's seen success, who's seen failures. And I think it's great how you said you probably learn more from the businesses that failed than the ones that have done well. And I agree with my personal experience also. It's definitely the same way. Yeah. And this is the raw stuff. Like, I'm not writing a book on this. I'm not talking from the stage. I'm on TV next week. I'm not talking about it here. Literally, you guys are getting, like, the raw baby steps from how I did it, what I failed at, all these different things, which I don't usually give out. But I really like Tao. I really like this show. I think it's going to help a lot of people. So I want to be real with you guys. Thanks, Spencer. I appreciate you, man. And, uh, you know, that's like I said, that's what this show is all about. Really just trying to help people that have this idea and create a business out of it and try and make the least amount of mistakes on the way and give them real life advice and practical advice is more like it on how to best succeed, you know, without wasting years. You know, you're obviously going to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes, but at the end of the day, you want to hurt not hurry the process but make it as efficient as possible expedite expedite exactly yep and the only way to do that is listen you can always buy information you can buy information you can get information you have google you have all these resources but what you cannot buy these days or you will have to buy is experience experience yes sir you cannot get experience through the internet yeah that's definitely one thing you know you can read as many books as you want people say oh you read a book you get 20 years of experience in 200 pages but that's not a that's not totally true you know you can get somebody else's story but you can't get the practical application of what they did right right you get what they want you to know they did yeah you don't get the nitty-gritty like we're getting with you right now and that's that's what i think is the most valuable to people is this stuff that you don't hear on the radio or in the books this is like the real raw story of people like you. So thank you again you know, for it. coming on thank here. You. So let's get this ball rolling a little bit. So you went from Jewels for Junk, and then you jumped into Nexi. How did you yeah. make that transition? <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that. that. This is probably one of the funniest stories of my entire life. <laughs> and, and it was the probably the scariest thing I've ever done like probably to this point, and I've had kids, I got married. Like it is the scariest thing I've ever done. So I was doing Jewels for Your Junk, and the government of Peru sent me an email. And I'm like, I don't even know how they got my email. I don't even know if this is real. This seems like a scam. Why would the government of Peru email me? Well, it comes out, I did some investigation, and I had a friend who had been to this show before. It's called Peru Moda. And it was in Peru, and they wanted me to come because they manufacture cotton. Cotton you use for underwear. It made sense. Egyptian cotton's really good, but then they have something called Pima cotton, which is really, really good cotton. So they wanted to fly me out, check it out, see if I could manufacture there instead of in China, blah, blah, blah. So I go, and I was kind of, you know, I was not doing that well financially at that time. And I had never been out of the country on my own. I didn't have an international phone plan. I didn't have an international credit card. I didn't even know if my credit cards would work, quite frankly. And I didn't have currency exchange because I flew in at like 11 o'clock at night because that's what they flew me in on. So anyway, scared out of my mind. My family literally, I remember my uncle saying, they're going to harvest your spleen when you get there. (laughs) Oh, God. And I said, you know what? I'm going. And I almost didn't go, but I had a buddy who said, dude, you'll regret this for the rest of your life if you don't go. I said, yeah, worst case, I'll just fly home, I guess. So I get there. There was like, like I said, it was like 11 o'clock at night. They had armed guards in the airport, which was new. And I got in this taxi and they're 
anyway, you can read about this story in my book. It's really funny. It really is one of the funniest stories now that I tell it from the other side. Um, and it's, it's pretty detailed in my book. But anyway, uh, I go to Peru and I met these guys on the side of the street. I thought they were coming to mug me, but they wanted to talk to the buddy that I met at the show and they knew him. They were from Brazil. They liked what I did. We had dinner. It didn't, I had no intention, but they said, you know what? I really like you. We want to be in the United States in that market with our brand. Why don't we just give you our brand to take to the United States? We'll give you 50% of the U.S. market. Damn. Um, okay. Well, let's do it. So, but, but I would have never even had the opportunity to do that if I didn't get completely 100% out of my comfort zone. Yeah, you got to make and that leap that, of faith. Wow. You have to take the leap of faith. What was the worst thing that could happen? Well, the worst thing I they could harvest your spleen or something like that. I guess that's the worst <laughs> case, right? Right. But at the end of the day, what's worse? Living with no spleen and maybe whatever, or knowing that you literally missed out on one of the biggest opportunities of your life. Like uh, that's that's a huge, huge thing that I'm all about is I ask myself, would I regret this? And not regret like, oh, live with no regrets, all that stuff. I'm like, seriously, would I think about, hey, I wish I would have done that. And it was five years ago. Can you go back and redo it? No. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And usually those are when I've grown the most is when I take that huge leap and do it that way. Yeah, so anyway, got into that. And then that business was great. But again, fashion is crazy and took too much money. And I was like, this is a lot of work, which is, I'm not about, uh, not, not about working hard, but it was just the ROI was not there, right? It's gotta be an investment. You gotta be, have a return. So the return on my investment of time was just not there. So I said, I'm going back into real estate. And that's kind of, like I said, I got jewels, I got fashion. I mean, I wasn't doing bad. I was a CEO of two brands. Like that's most people's dream, but the absolute money part and the ROI on my time was just not there because I had had the experience of real estate is probably why. Right. I think but, it's good. I think it's really beneficial for you how you knew what you wanted. You know what I mean? Because if you didn't know that you wanted to be in real estate, you could have gone on doing that for who knows how many years. And I think it's really important that people know what they want out of life. You know, like you. Yeah, like absolutely. You, you need that solid ROI. Do you kind of off the subject a little bit but do you have a passion for cooking is that something you want to still pursue in the future yeah Maybe we'll... absolutely i think it'd be fun to have my own restaurant um that's like super just whatever i like and i've i've kind of come to the conclusion of if i like it it's not that bad i have pretty good taste i guess <laughs> yeah you know i i like the finer things of life um and that's kind of what makes me work so hard is because i got to be able to afford my my lifestyle right and it's not because i want to show off to people either it's because i like it i wear louboutin red bottom shoes not for everybody else or to impress anybody else because i really don't care and quite frankly most people don't like them but i enjoy wearing them one they're comfortable two they look pretty badass right. so you gotta you gotta and i i life coach a lot of people and, and do business coaching sales coaching whatever and there's really something i ask them is what do you want? Why do you want it? How are you going to get there? And then that all leads to reverse engineering your life. You're starting with the end in mind, right? So the life coaching part of that is literally those questions. And that will help you shape your roadmap of where you should be going, put you on the right trajectory, and then move you forward. Wow, that's incredible. That's like you have an idea and then you meet up with somebody like you or if you're creative enough, you need to do it, you do it on your own or you deal with a matter and then you literally find your end product, where you want to be, what you want to do, why you want to do it. Like you said, just reverse engineer it and it makes everything so much simpler, I think, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I have agents, I have a brokerage, real estate brokerage, and I had an agent who's a great top producing agent in one market, I wanted to level up, 
go to the major leagues to sell $5 million properties instead of $1 million properties. She's doing great at a million dollar properties. Like you can't get much better than that in most parts of the area. But I know she could do better, right? So what do we have to do? We have to say, okay, how are we going to get there? What's going to drive you to get there? That's your why. Where are we driving you to? And then we're, we literally work backwards. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now we know where we're going. We know how we're getting there. We know what to do. Let's do it. There's your roadmap right there. Wow, that's incredible. So you do a lot of coaching, you said? Yeah, and, and you can do it through sending me an email or whatever. I have different coaching packages. We have some boot camp group sessions. We do business coaching. You know, I go into all companies and literally coach their whole company, like corporately, and get their whole structure, system, procedures, all that stuff so they can be efficient, right? Because without efficiency at that level, you're going to crash because mm-hmm. it costs too much money to operate, stuff like that. But my favorite thing is these people that really want to get started, but they don't know how. That's my favorite people to coach because they're hungry. And they actually do what you – they're going to do what you say. (laughs) Right. It's the most important part. Yeah. You know? And then the other thing – this is just a – this is a freebie. A lot of people be like, oh, can you do it for free? I don't have it. No. Not because I don't want to and because I don't want to help, but because I have enough experience to know if you didn't pay for it, you won't have the value on it to be able to implement it. Mm-hmm. And that's really the truth. Something you get for free, you don't value as much as something you had to stretch for. You're going to get every single thing out of that that you possibly could if you paid and stretched. You know, My packages are about $5,000. For a new business, that's a lot of money. That might be their whole budget for startup. Right. But guess what? My one connection will literally give you $10,000 in a day, right? Mm-hmm. Or that w- that will save you $20,000 in a mistake you would have made. So value your mentors. You, you need to have mentors and you need to take care of them. Don't expect them to take care of you. That's backwards. And the successful people I've always hung out with, I always pay for them. It's weird. It's like the people that should be paying or could pay are never the ones that should actually pay in that situation. And I've always made it a principle. So that's something just for the newer, you know, idea stage. Really, really take that and use that. And it will get you so much, so much more valuable than any dollar you could spend. Yeah, that, uh... (laughs) That hit home I could for tell sure, you, you know. I could tell you stories and stories and stories. I can't tell you names, but there are so many stories of that, that in my life. And I've taken care of every single mentor. I, I still keep in contact with them. And I take care of them as best I can. Even people that I were my mentors and I grew out of and now I'm more successful, I still I took one to Hawaii with me last year. Literally. Let's go to Hawaii. Okay. Yeah. Paid. Why? Not Not because I was showing off. Because they were that detrimental to my success, right? I yeah. wouldn't have been there without them. No, that's that's a great quality that you have for sure. You don't have to kindle those relationships. Like you said, even after you outgrow someone, they at one point you were nothing and then they were like the celebrity. And just because you leveled up above them doesn't mean you're better than them. You know, they helped you on a foundational <laughs> level. Yeah, remember, you would never be there if they didn't put you in that position. Right, exactly, exactly. Okay, so let's jump back into this. After your fashion industry stunt, you got back into real estate, moved back to Newport Beach, and I know you started working for a business and you helped them grow their uh, vacancy rates almost to 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And then from that also increase their portfolio from sixty to a hundred million dollars. Yeah, I would really that efficiency love, part. I would love it's all to about hear system, about procedures that. Yeah. and efficiency. Can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah, so I came on they were probably at like, you know, sixty to eighty percent. And they're not bad. They weren't failing, but they weren't optimizing what they had. And I'm all about efficiency. You know that if you have an asset and it's not performing to its fullest capacity, you're losing money, right? So they had 60 
to 80%, let's say 80. So out of 100 units, they had 80 rented. They're losing, let's say, $1,000 a month on 20 units. That's $20,000 a month in a loss, opportunity loss. Mm -hmm. They're still making $80,000, yes. And most people go wrong because they look at, oh, well, I'm making $80,000. Yeah, but you're losing opportunity on $20,000, right? Right. So what I did is I tried to narrow that and bridge bridge the gap between the two. So I created system procedures. I took their whole uh, leasing process, their on-site management, all of those processes that were done paper and pen, I put them virtual. And I streamlined it so nobody had to do it. It was all templated. It was all online resources. People could do it themselves because they were going to do it anyway. And so by doing that, it was all efficiency-based. We could do more, more productive. And then by having 100%, you have so much cash, you then can't keep the cash on hand, it's called, because then you have to re spend it so you don't have to pay taxes you get to buy more products it's free money at that point because you can't spend you cannot spend a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars or a hundred million dollars a month like you could but it's not smart (laughs) right so you can if you're buying income producing so it's investing but anyway that's kind of what i did there and then i was like you know really don't want to do this anymore. I kind of tapped out. I mean, what, what else more is there? I could go into the acquisitions, whatever. So about that time, you get this kind of stirring. And I've noticed every time I'm about to level up, you get this uncomfortability. And that's not a bad thing. It means there's something else coming that's better. And you got to embrace it. Most people don't, and then they quit, or they do something else, or they get discouraged. No, it just means something else is coming that's better. So my dad called me, and mind you, this was after the accident. He couldn't do it on his own, but he had a referral from a long time ago, a friend that, that knew him and trusted him and wanted him to help. His house had burnt down and needed help rebuilding it, and they had some problems with the insurance, things like that. So my dad reached out to me and said, hey, would you help us? I said, nope, hell no. I don't want to be in that business. I already got out of the construction business like three times. I'm not getting back in. Well, he kept pushing and pushing. And I said, no, I'm not doing it. I don't want to be in business. And I definitely don't want to be in business as a mom and pop and the way that you run the company. Right? Not that he ran a bad, just not my style. Right. So from there, finally, he like, listen, I'll give you 50% of everything you make. Oh, okay. Well, let me make two phone calls. Made two phone calls and tripled the budget. I said, damn, I'm good at this. Right? So then I uh, started a construction company. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> I was like, damn, damn it, again, here we go. No, but this time it was my company. That was the difference. Right. No, I that totally makes sense. So to break that down a little bit more, those two phone calls that you made, not to name any names or anything, but those were were those contacts you made through your uh, real estate experience, or who did you reach out to? Uh, what did those conversations look so like? So those were the people involved that were kind of having the the hard time of getting the funding and things like that. So they weren't direct connections from uh, my real estate, but the way in which I handled them, my experience of dealing with that type of situation from the bigger, uh, I call it bigger deals. Um, That's how I was able to close it in two phone calls. That's really why it's not, not necessarily the connection. It was more the way in which I would have never been able to do that if I didn't manage a hundred million dollar portfolio. I didn't have the knowledge to be able to understand what they were talking about. So it was the experience that got me that. Right. Okay. That's awesome. And, uh, for those 18 months that you were working with that company and you grew the portfolio from 60 to 100 and boost the va- non-vacancy to almost 100%, which is incredible, by the way. Thank you. Um, was that I had a good team. No, I really did. It's so important. You know, I work at a, uh investment company now here in Cleveland, and they do property management as well. I'm more on the acquisition side. But it's a good I, place to be. Yeah, no, for sure. I see them... Um, I don't want to say struggling with the non-vacancy issues, but I can see... It's always, always the problem in a portfolio. Just like you said, you know, it's a lost opportunity. And 
people, oh, we're at 80%, but what if we're at 95%? How much more money could we be making? How much more could we be growing? How much more could we be investing back into the company? It's exactly. Just, it's just a different way of thinking. You know, you need to switch your mindset from like, oh, this is good how it is, but like, yeah, you, you gotta have an elevated way of thinking. You gotta think the positive, not the bare minimum. Absolutely. So, was that single family or multi-family that you were doing um, over there? That was a, it was a mix. It was a lot of apartment buildings, but mostly it was like duplex, triplex in Newport Beach on the peninsula. Very, very valuable real Super estate. Super high class, high end real estate. Okay. Our rents were like five to eight thousand a month for a duplex each right. unit. Yep. So. Okay, so that's awesome. Awesome, Spencer. So now, you know, you, you uh, created the Chambers organization. And yeah. you kind of have taken all your experience and put it un- under one umbrella. So tell yep. us what you're up to right now, what your company does, what you do, you know. And then I'll ask you a few final questions and we yeah, can no uh, wrap this up. So my main vertical right now is construction. Um, the thing that I thought I would never be in. But what I realized is along my life and and a mentor, again, going back to those, I have a lot of mentors. They said, if something bugs you, don't complain about it. Fix it. And somehow along the way that clicked. I hate construction. It's not that I didn't like building houses. I love building things. Like that's my favorite thing to do is build high rises. I built a thirty-four million dollar high rise, did a whole renovation, all that stuff. Like I love that stuff. What I don't like is the way it's working, the operational side of it. Mm. So what I did is I took my company, I said, I'm gonna mimic what Uber did with the taxi companies. And yeah, it made an uproar, pissed a lot of people off, people lost their jobs, which is unfortunate, I agree. But I'm going to do that for construction because now Uber is autonomous. They're transparent. They're efficient. They're digital. All those things are necessary and coming in construction. So I'm going to be the one to bring it in, right? So now I have a construction management company where we're digital. I can build a house in Washington State while living in Newport Beach. I go there and visit the site once, maybe twice a week, um, if it's a really big project, right? Or somebody from my team, kind of like the Uber driver, would go pick you up, right? I'm in headquarters, but anyway. So that's kind of that um, idea, is we're literally taking the construction industry and make it, which is very, very analog, right? Paper and pen, Mm -hmm. blueprints that are all rolled out and people are still using, you know, transfer paper, which some of the listeners maybe not even know what it is. It's like a really, really see-through paper that you can sketch on. Like that's old school. That's very analog. So now I'm all digital. We are a paperless construction company. Can you believe it? (laughs) So that is incredible. We have other contracts who are national, but then also I, I saw the need for, okay, So people are going to build a house. What are they going to do now? They're going to have to sell it. Well, they're going to have to sell the house they're in. So I might as well have my brokerage. So I have a sales brokerage. So we can sell your house. We can buy your land. We can do all the transactional parts, right? Then, you know, those same people, if they're smart and if they want to build wealth, they'll invest. So maybe they build the house or they build... Uh, a triplex or something like that, they're going to need investment management. They're going to need portfolio management. They're going to need some type of investment product, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe they want to keep their house they're in and then we manage that or we get tenants for it. Or maybe they just have a bunch of money and don't know what to do with it, which in my area, that's very, very common. So we put money in, we build the product, we buy the land, we manage the product. And at the end of the day, Instead of having three different hands with their hand out trying to get a commission for what they did, we just are one people, one, one company doing all the process. We own everything and we have our own ecosystem, right? We create our own ecosystem for investments. So then your, your actual fee that you would have paid is decreased 
which means your value goes up. So you'll make more money working with us because we cut out all the middleman. It's really what we did. Right. So, so one-stop we're really, shop. really efficient. Yes. That's awesome. One-stop shop for everything investment needed, you know, as far as real estate, construction, selling your house. And then you do also some uh, financial education also, like you were saying before, some coaching, personal coaching, business yeah, coaching. Of yeah, so I do that because, you know, I, I've found a lot of people while I'm talking to them and selling them product and things like that, that, that they really do need. I, I don't ever want to sell anyone anything. And every, you talk to anybody in my organization, we do not want to sell somebody. We want to allow them to buy, right? It's a mm-hmm. whole different shift and your, your whole paradigm shift is different. We're not selling you something. We're giving you the opportunity to buy something. We don't want to be pushy. If you don't want it, that's fine. You should want it. We need to educate you on why it would be good for you to have it, but we're not going to cram it down your throat. That's just not who we are. Uh, good for you guys. Right? That's Because uh, from what I've seen, a lot of times salespeople that are like that, they have a very bad reputation, especially for um, – how old are you now, by the way? 28. 28. So I'm 26. So for our generation, people have a very bad – stigma around salespeople you know what i mean yeah of course because it's course. i mean that's how our the older generations grew you know you sell 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 push 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 but times are changed now you know with information overload everywhere it, it, things are just completely different exactly and so people a lot of my clients are diy people right oh i don't need a general contractor i can youtube it you're absolutely right but what happens if it doesn't go the way the youtube guys went <laughs> yeah. right That's where I come in as not your general contractor charging you 35%, but I come in as your safety net. Hey, it's okay. You tried your best. There's no problem with that. I want you to do that. Now you have the experience. But also here we are as your management company to make sure that you're going to be taken care of because it is a big investment. It's a great asset to have, and you don't want to ruin it, right, just because – or the other option is general contract coming in. Oh, he tried to do it himself. I'm going to jack the price up because now he needs me, mm-hmm. right? That's just not ethical in my opinion. I want to just start out, say, hey, you're going to do it yourself. That's awesome. We're here to give you their schedules, the budgets, to make sure you know what you're doing. And if you have a problem, call us. That's what we're on retainer for. And you're going to save a ton of money along the way, and you're going to make more money, but you're going to have the comfort of knowing that you have us as your safety net if something went wrong. If the city says, hey, I need a T24, most of my homers go, what the hell is that? Yeah. Right? It's a Title 24 energy calculation that the state of California requires each homeowner to, to give them when they get a set of plans. Right? I know that. But I don't expect the homeowners to know that either. Right? Right. So that's why you have somebody like us. It's like a management company. You don't want to get a uh, when you have a property management company, a phone call at midnight because the toilet won't flush, you don't want that. No, yeah. Right? You mm-hmm. have a management company to take care of those things. And at the end of the day, you will make more money because it allows you to do what you do best, which got you the ability to buy that unit or that property or product or whatever, which is make more money to spend more on this versus putting out fires or trying to figure it out of something that irritates you that you don't want to do with to begin with. Right. So in the end, it all comes back to efficiency. You know what I exactly. mean? Exactly. Spending exactly. your time wisely instead of, I, you, are you familiar with Dean Graziosi? I am not. He's also a real estate investor. He has a great story where he uh, bought an apartment building and his parents were very like hands on and you work, do everything yourself. You, you don't pay anyone to do anything. And now he's the opposite. And the way he realized yeah. that, He was one day mowing his lawn and some large property took him four, five, six hours. And in that same six hours where he could pay someone to do it for a hundred bucks, but not do it himself, he could go to his other, his other business and sell two cars and make two, three thousand dollars. Exactly. And that's all it comes back to, you know, and you have to like check your ego at the door and just do what is best you know (laughs) yeah exactly whatever makes money i don't care about who's better the dollar at the end of the day is going to tell you who's better at their job right but there's no reason to say it just hey if you're good at your thing 
I'm not good at your thing, so you do it. Right? That's just all it is. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's awesome. So uh, something I do want to ask you really quick. Uh, you talk a lot about mentorship and your own mentors. That's something that you hear a lot of entrepreneurs talking about. The more successful entrepreneurs that you need to have mentors and get guidance. What would you give as far as guidance to someone? Let's say someone like me who's looking to connect with some real estate investors to kind of create that mentorship opportunity. What advice would you give to somebody like me? I would say go put yourself in the position of where you think you want to be. So if you think you want to be a multifamily unit owner, go look at multifamily unit properties. Maybe you can't afford it, but guess what? The people that can will be looking at that same property and then you're going to you're going to know what it feels like. You're going to know how to interact with them. You're going to be them before you actually are them. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, so it's not absolutely. a fake it. It's not a fake it till you make it. I want to be very, very clear. You do not fake it till you make it, but you immerse yourself into what you want to be because eventually you will be that. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's almost like manifestation. You know, you should kind of surround yourself with these type of people that you want to be and in turn they will bring you up as opposed to hanging around with a bunch of shitty people not or whatever and they'll just yeah. bring you down you know what i mean yeah y- your income is within five thousand dollars average of all your circle of friends so if you want to get a more income you got to start hanging out with rich people that's really that simple not because they're rich because their mind, it has nothing to do with money. None of anything I'm talking to you guys about today has to do with money at all. It has to do with a mindset, has to do with the way they think about money. Money's fake. Money is a piece of paper, right? Yeah. Bitcoin is fake. It's something on the internet. What puts value on it is people and the perception of it different yeah. attributes i think it's interesting how you said that it's, it's not the money itself but it's how they got it and how they think about it and how they think about it how they if interact. it's disposable if it's valuable if it's a tool if it's an asset there's lots of ways to think about money but just how do you think about money do you think about it as all oh, i need to p- money to pay my rent or hey i need money so that i can go hire this guy to make me this amount of money or hey i need that for a down payment so that I can have this, so I have residual income, so that I don't have to work anymore. It just changes the way you think about it. Money never actually changes. It's how you think about it that changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, you hit that right on the head for sure. That's a great answer. I really appreciate that question. So just a couple final questions. I like to ask everybody this. So what is something that you is almost like a must for you to do every day, you know, whether that's walking on the beach, you know, taking a swim, exercising, what, what is, do you have something that you kind of do every single day? Um, something I try to do every day is some form of working out, not in the gym, physical pumping iron meathead. I'm talking like you can walk and talk just the mental aspect of working out. Business is a mental game. Athletes train every single day, if they're playing football, hours and hours a day. I was with uh, Rampage Jackson, a UFC fighter, probably two months ago. And I was at one of his private trainings before he fought. I forget who it was. And, And he's going hard. And he's practicing. And he's practicing harder than he would actually perform, right? He's kicking these guys. He had three opponents, and he was going to, to a southpaw opponent, so they were all southpaw. It was exactly the same. But he had three of them versus one of them all at the same time. I'm not joking. This guy is a beast. Yep. And I go into the boardroom because we were doing a, a sponsor deal thing for somebody else. I was helping negotiate one of those coaching things I was telling you about. I, I went in with one of my mentees, and I was like, look, let me help you negotiate this. That right there. You want to know why you have mentors? Because when they say that, you say, hell yeah. Hell yeah. I, just made that, I made that guy a lot more money than whatever he paid me. Anyway, beside the point. 
So I go in there and nothing bad on Rampage or anything. But I was shocked. Like they didn't they didn't train in the boardroom like they trained on the octagon. Yeah. <laughs> like, dude, you're a business. I know you're a fighter, but you're also a brand. Like you gotta fight. So I I, I took away from that as dude, if you if you're if you're in the business game, you gotta be fighting. You gotta be training every day. And that's what I'm talking about. You gotta go to the gym. I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks while I'm at the gym and I go to the sauna. I really try to go to the sauna at least every day just to clear my head and chill out and really focus on what I need to get done, what I'm doing, where I'm going, and the mental workout of all that. And so that's probably the one thing I do every day. Uh, that's awesome. I could not agree more with you. You know, people are all about the gym, the gym, but how you said it's not to, not necessarily pumping iron, but working your brain, clearing your mind, and getting clear on where you're going and what you're doing. Yeah, and I think the gym, the physical aspect is important. Don't right. get no, me wrong. Because guess what? If your physical body can't handle it and can't move or is sick, your brain's going to be way worse off. And you can't, you can't, you got to use your legs to move your brain to the business to go where you're going. So you got to have some physical fitness, right? But the mental part of that as well, paired together, is what I think I've always seen as the number one key thing for all very, very hyper-successful entrepreneurs. Right. And uh, kind of piggybacking off of that, you hear a lot of people talking about different ways to set goals, daily goals, huge goals, um, achievable goals. What are your thoughts on setting goals on kind of elaborate on that a little bit yeah so it's the same thing we were talking about earlier you got to reverse engineer your life what do you want and why do you want it right cut out all the bullshit my mom said i couldn't do this why why can't you do it just like that agent well why why should i sell a million dollars i'm I'm making a hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year so yeah but why aren't you making a half a million dollars a year well i don't know because i've always made a hundred eighty thousand dollars a year so make 500. It's what do you want? Why do you want it? What? Because the what you want is important. But the why you want it is even more important because that's what's going to drive you. Yeah. That's what's going to drive you to be what you want to be is your why. So reverse engineer your life. That's how I say goals. You can do yearly goals. You do all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's what do you want and why do you want it and where are you going? Wow, that's awesome. I know, because it's very confused. Everyone has something else to say about that, but that, yeah. the way it's you said preference. that almost makes the most sense. You know, like you can set daily goals, but if you have that in mind, like you said, your end goal and what you want to do, where you want to be, and why you want to get there, it makes everything much easier and less, much less confusion. That's why people like coaching me. I cut through all the crap. I do it in a nice way. Like, I'm a nice guy. <laughs> I want you to succeed. But I also, I ask you questions I don't tell you you're an idiot. I've never once said that. You think that, well, you shouldn't, by the way, because you're in front of somebody who obviously you're smart enough to get in front of to help you. So you're not an idiot. You're actually really smart. And I'm going to ask you questions to let you come up with the answer. Because if I tell you, oh, you need to do this, 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 that ain't you. That's me. Mm-hmm. Right? What I do is not going to work for somebody else. But if I ask you questions to get to where you should go because that's where you take it, then that's going to be your true answer because you can't be anybody but yourself, and you shouldn't. You were born an original. Don't die a copy. That's one of my mentors. That's wow. what he says. You can re- research that. He's on Oprah. Like He is a big deal, and that is his quote. I'm going to give him full credit. But that's the truth. You cannot try to be somebody else. You can only be you, and you should be you on purpose. Well, yeah, you got to embrace it, you know. People are always trying to be like Gary Vee, be like this person, be like Cardone. But at the end of the day, like you said, we're, everyone is unique, and you just need to be yourself and uh, embrace that. Look, I was just with, if you look at my Instagram, I was just with a bunch of those guys, including Cardone. They're yeah, I saw that, me. yep. Look. I would not be with him if I was trying to be him. <laughs> That's the truth. Yeah. He'd be like, dude, who are you? I'm the, your reflection in the mirror. I don't need that. I'll just go look at the damn mirror. 
Yeah, that's awesome. No, that's, what were you uh, doing with Cardone? Huh, sorry to jump off topic real quick, but what was going uh, on over there? Just 10X growth, 10X growth Con is a great conference. So. Oh, how was that? It was awesome. It was definitely a great conference. I suggest everybody go to conferences wherever you're at, at whatever industry you're in. It's always good to meet people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I hear um, that the 10X Growth Con, people almost enjoyed the networking just as much as they did the actual speakers themselves. Yeah, I could definitely see that being a possibility. Mm-hmm. So let's uh, let's get one last question in that I like to ask. I think it kind of puts things in a perspective. So let's say you could go back uh, till when you're 17, 18, when you were just getting started with the with the family business and everything like that. What advice would you go back and give yourself? Honestly, you can't live with looking at the past of what you would have done or whatever. It got you to where I'm at. So I would say, look. The results are not that bad right now. So I, I must have done something. <laughs> You're doing something pretty good. Right. <laughs> right. And, and I'm not saying that in a cocky way. It's like, look, are you happy with where you're at? Then you made good choices. Could you have done something different? Yeah, but you might not be where you're at today. Or the reverse is you don't like where you're at today? Do something different tomorrow. You know, living mm. in the past is not going to help anybody. Right. Wow. That's uh that is the damn truth, you know. Wow. So sorry to sorry to take it and twist it a little bit, but no, no, this I think is, it's important. This is all about you, man. This is that's what I like to hear. What you really think? I don't want you to tell me what I want to hear. You know what I mean? That's it's not what this is about. It's all about you. Yeah. So, but anyway, I really did appreciate being on the show. I think it's a great show. It's going to help a lot of people, and uh, you're definitely one of the greatest. I think podcast guys out there right now, you got something new and fresh and I think you're going to hit the millennial market and even the baby boom market that are looking for something new and fresh and how to adapt. I think you're going to be able to hit it. So you guys definitely got to listen to the show more often. I'm sure he's gonna have some great, great people. Even some of my friends, I'll, I'll have them on here. I'm sure later on. So thank you again for having me. I really do appreciate it. Oh, uh, no. Thank you, Spencer. I really appreciate that. It's very nice of you. And uh, I just want to thank you, you know, for taking the time talking to me. And I uh, hope we get to meet in person one day. I'm sure I'll be out to Cali one of these days. Oh, yeah. Sun is always shining here in blue skies. Yeah, it's so. a beautiful thing. Okay, Spencer. Well, thank you, man. I really appreciate you coming on. And that is a wrap, everyone. I hope that you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. I got so much valuable knowledge when it comes to executing on your ideas from someone who's been in this industry for about a decade now, been in multiple industries, clothing, fashion, real estate, construction, sales. So this is a must listen, and I really, really hope you guys were taking notes because I know I was, and I got some super valuable information from this one. If you like this episode, make sure to go ahead on iTunes, subscribe, leave a comment, leave a review, because that really helps us gain traction. Uh, this is, is all organic right now, and I'm trying to reach as many people as I can because this is a very important concept, I believe, because you always hear people saying, oh, I have this idea, I have this idea, but they never do anything about it. I'm here to help bring those ideas into reality so they don't just die in the thought process. So I hope you guys enjoyed I had an amazing time today. Hop on Instagram or Facebook. I really love your guys' feedback. It means a lot to me. And I take it into consideration every single time because this show is to help you guys execute on your dreams. So that's what I'm here to do. Okay, guys. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to this. I know it's crazy. So just you committing to listen means the world to me. I really appreciate it. And I will see you guys next time.